because we couldn't do it without you. So thank you to each and every one of you for helping us have this memorable year. It's been our pleasure to help you. If you've never worn Red Wing boots, stop in and see what we're all about at 3003 Main Avenue in Fargo. Red Wing shoes for ultimate durability. This is Weather and Ag in Focus with Bridget Riedel, Justin Storm, and Dean Wysocki. And welcome to Weather and Ag in Focus. Thanks for joining us. It's finally Friday. It's a beautiful afternoon out there. I'm meteorologist Justin Storm with Ag Director Bridget Riedel. And Bridget, how are you doing today? Are you enjoying this nice, warm, sunny weather out there? Just listening to ice crash off the trees. That's what's going on today. <laughs> Been watching it all day. There's still a good amount of ice on the tree, but man, the ring of shattered ice underneath the tree is something else. It's impressive. And there's a lot more to melt off, which I think folks are very happy with. And I think that's going to continue for a little while, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I would totally agree. Today's a good melting day. A lot of uh, mid upper 30s, a few low 40s today with sunny skies and the warm temperatures with the sun, kind of like a double whammy. You get the radiation heating from the sun, the warm ambient air temperature just helping to chip away at that ice and a little bit of a breeze about 5 to 15 miles an hour to kind of help keep that ice in motion, kind of crack it up whenever we get those little slight gusts around the area. We'll get a full rundown on the forecast coming up here in just a moment. If you want to join in on the program today, join our conversation, ask some questions. Uh, let us know if you had any damage from the ice storm, really anything at all. Your show is just as much as it is ours. 701-293-9000 is the Red Wing Shoes phone line. Again, 701 293 9000 Or emails, weather or ag at flagfamily.com. It's how you can get a part of the conversation. And a few things we'll be running down on the show today is the U of M strategic farming session, pesticide mm -hmm. applicator training for North Dakota and South Dakota. And our third topic that we'll get to today is the Minnesota farmer wins the farm all farm all farm all tractor anniversary tractor. Well, I think we, we have, have three those and topics from yesterday. From yesterday. We didn't even get a chance <laughs> to get through all of those yesterday. But okay, so this farm all tractor, let's just start with that. Um, that's that's rather cool because here's what happened. Farm all is a brand name in tractors that's been around for 100 years. 2023 was that 100th anniversary. And even though that that brand is now a part of Case IH overall, farm all wanted to celebrate its heritage on the farm and especially in this region. And they did an essay contest. The winner of that essay contest happens to be Steve Wilson from Rochester, Minnesota. Steve won a new farm all utility tractor, the 75C. He's a three-time cancer survivor. He talked about the longevity of farm alls on his operation, what they've been a part of in his region with his parents, etc., and why farm all has really been an outstanding brand name in tractors that for many years and so steve was awarded that tractor recently i know that farm all has done a lot of different things this last year as far as promotion if you remember back in about may my brothers were at an auction sale and they found my dad's one of his farm alls that he'd had from the 70s and they matched the serial numbers bought it brought it home and i'd made a post about that thinking okay maybe not necessarily such a big deal right well, apparently it was to farm all because they did reach out and they sent a gift to our family for bringing home and preserving the heritage of one of the farm all tractors. So farm all's had a big year and I'm glad to see we got to be a part of that. Yeah, that's super cool. It's always a fun story when you hear things like that. And uh, what did they all send over to your, to your brothers? Back the um, they, they were able to get, you know, some small things like insulated coffee mugs and commemorative items. But then also they did put in a credit towards the restoration of that tractor. So if you needed to replace some seals or lights or anything like that, the guys were able to go in and pick those up at their local Case IH dealership, which is Titan Machinery. Oh, super cool. And uh, before we get, well, I'll save that to towards the end of this segment. Why don't we hit one more ag topic? Let's bust away one of the ones from yesterday we didn't have time to get to. And that was the uh, danger of high nitrates and uh, forages. <laughs> Well, what's going on right now is we had a fairly dry summer in 2023, and we're setting up to see some of that again in 2024. When that happens, you actually have high nitrate content in some of your forage crops. Now, 
it is important to make sure that you test those forages for that high nitrate because they can in fact poison cattle or sheep. Those nitrate tests are available from extension services in both Dakotas and Minnesota. So you can have that looked at. And animals really like to have that, that calm environment. If something's upsetting to them, they'll eat more. And when they do that, they're pulling in more of that high nitrate forage. So we want to make sure that we're testing those in the cases of dry years. Think ahead about that for some of your pasture and hay ground from 23 into 24, et cetera. That might be something we have to keep in mind. Yeah, right on. Not something, uh, well, I'm sure this is probably something that crosses some people's mind, but something that would never have crossed mine, but I guess I'm not really involved in it, so I don't suppose why it would. Well, this ties into the third topic from yesterday, but then also your whole weather forecast with the LRC. We've had our weather special back here in early December, and we talked about what the season is going to look like going into spring of 2024. And coming off of this dry year, not only do we want to watch our forages for higher nitrates, but because of some of that drier condition, that's one of the reasons being attributed to more open cows in herds. Okay, so when you have an open cow, means after you put the bulls out or you did artificial insemination, you have an animal who's not pregnant. If she's not pregnant, that's called an open cow. And we're seeing above average rates for open cows as we brought cattle in off of pasture this summer. Uh, into the fall, etc. Some of those reasons, of course, are with drought. Some of the grasses were stripped from their nutrients that they might normally have, so they weren't in as good body condition scores for those cows as what they could have been. Cows actually do get judged. I'm sorry, I know we're not supposed to body judge, but we are doing it for cows. <laughs> and also, some of the pests that we have, you know, we've we've talked about this before. When it's dry weather conditions, we see more grasshoppers for one. Grasshoppers also strip those forages down so that they're not as plentiful and as nutrious, nutrient for our livestock. And then also flies. When you have flies that are bothering cows, it can literally affect them so badly that they can abort if they, the fetus if they were already pregnant or they can carry disease, pink eye and other problems in which are those are also going to affect the overall health of the cow and then lead to the possibility of that cow not being pregnant when you bring her back in in the fall. So some things to think about as we go into next year, how the weather conditions affect our cow herd rates as well. So when you're out doing pregnancy checks on these uh, cows and you realize, oh, it's an open cow, uh, another open mm -hmm. cow, do they miss their window or can they try again and then they just get set back a couple months in calving or how does that look? So this is just going to be my little window into livestock production. And we do have a livestock expert coming on later that might be able to have answer this question too. When you think about that open cow, you got to make some decisions. Do we want to try to get her pregnant, find the right cycle, get her pregnant, but then she's going to be later calving. Is that a fit for your operation? Can you have some later calving or is that going to run into grain farming? or if she's not, going to have, she's not going to be out of cycle, so to speak, with the rest of the cows. If she's open and you don't want to keep her around and try to either hold her for a year where she's open or get her bred so that she can produce a calf, then you can cull those cows. You can haul them in and sell them or do a private treaty to a neighbor because you don't want that open critter. If you're feeding an animal that's not producing a calf, that's a loss, right? Because the calf crop is the cash crop for your cattle. So you want to make sure that you're always able to get more income out of your herd. They're treated in great shape. Animals are well, well cared for on our farms and ranches, but they are still part of a profit system because if it wasn't profitable to farm, it'd be called volunteerism. <laughs> Very good point, Bridget, and thanks for clarifying that. We'll do a quick rundown on the forecast here up into the weekend. I'll give you a full look at the forecast at the bottom of our show in the 150 segment. We'll run down the 7 to 10 day extended forecast. What we're looking at today, a uh, lot of blue skies out there. It's about 38 degrees right now. We'll top out close to 40 here in the FM metro. A lot of upper 30s and low 40s around our area. Sunny skies eating away at the ice with a west-northwest wind 5 to 15. Clouds roll in for tonight. We'll level temperatures off in the lower 20s. Northwest winds pick up about 10 to 25 miles per hour. And then that leads to a blustery day. For tomorrow on Saturday, it's going to be mostly cloudy. Temperatures are in the mid-20s. 
Northwest winds will gust upwards of 30 miles an hour, along with a slight chance for a few light scattered snow showers, mainly over in Minnesota, but we'll see a few up and down the valley. Little accumulation, uh, most areas a half inch to a light dusting. Uh, a couple localized areas may see upwards of an inch over into Minnesota and up towards uh, say Crookston and Bemidji might be able to pick up an inch of accumulation, but then that comes to an end for Saturday night. Uh, I don't think it's going to be enough to really cause any slick travels, but with the wind and while snow is falling, there might be a few spots that see a little reduced visibility. Uh, to end the weekend on Sunday, we'll start to see a little more sunshine by the end of the day. The winds will lighten up as well, but temperatures will remain in the mid-20s. But for reference, that's still above average. We should be right around 20 to 19 degrees this upcoming weekend. So if we're still looking at temperatures in the mid-20s, that's not bad. And there are more above average temperatures in the forecast than the extended. I'll give you that here coming up at about 152 or so. But coming up in our next segment, our guest is going to be joining us. And uh, Bridget, I think you can give a better introduction uh, for our <laughs> guest than I can. Because I think you know a little bit more about what she does. And that guest is going to be Lisa. It's uh, Peterson, correct? Correct. I hope I'm not making up any of the qualifications that Lisa has, but she is a livestock extension specialist for North Dakota State University. And she is one of a team that is putting on something called the Emergency Handling for Livestock. They literally have a seminar. It's Bovine Emergency Response Program. I think this is pretty valuable for many of our rural fire departments, especially who may get transport of livestock through their region and how they can handle that in case there's an accident. I'm really looking forward to this discussion with Lisa, especially after that ice storm we just had earlier this week. So, Justin, get your questions ready. I think today's going to be a lot of fun to discuss. So we will do that in just a few moments. Stay with us for Lisa Peterson. Livestock market is mixed, but mostly higher. For the American Ag Network, I'm Richard Risfet with this market update. Although the overall direction of the entire market is impacted very little due to the limited open interest in spot December contracts, the sharp triple-digit gains in December trade is the focus of the complex. It's been said many times through the holiday season already, trade volume remains very light and activity levels sluggish. This has the opportunity for prices to wander in moderate to wide ranges without significant trades being done. Mixed price moves are holding in feeder cattle and lean hog contracts, which may keep prices mixed within a narrow to moderate range through most of the session. With Monday being New Year's Day, trade will remain silent until Tuesday morning as traders prepare to start the 2024 trading year and likely bring about renewed overall volume and interest. Cash cattle trade remains undeveloped following light trade in most areas yesterday. Bids have redeveloped at 172 live basis and 273 dress basis, although current asking prices are at least a dollar higher than current bids at this point. Trade yesterday developed at 172 live basis, which is one dollar higher than last week's average. Dress trade at 272 to 273 were generally two to three dollars higher than last week's average. Box beef prices are mixed, choice down 241 and select up 120 with a movement of 50 loads. We'll get a look at the livestock numbers next. You're listening to the American Ag Network. Welcome to Soybean Minute, your source for timely soybean news. I am North Dakota Soybean Council Director Dallas Luff of Wapaton. The North Dakota Soybean Council will be seeking nominations for county and district representatives in Lemoore, Dickey, Cass, and Stutzman counties, along with District 11, which consists of 13 northwestern counties in North Dakota. If you are a soybean farmer and live in one of these counties, you will receive a nomination form in the mail in December. If you have a passion for the soybean industry, a commitment to serve, and want to be a part of a progressive, strategic, and collaborative commodity board, consider nominating yourself or a fellow soybean producer in your county. Serving on the council board will enable you to influence how checkoff dollars are invested, shape the future of our commodity, increase your industry knowledge, and expand your network in the soybean industry. For more information about our election process, visit ndsoybean.org. That's ndsoybean.org. This message is brought to you by the North Dakota Soybean Council and the Soybean Checkoff. Let's get a look at the livestock numbers. Live kale December up 247 at 173.67. February up a dime at 169.02. April up 42 at 172.70. And the June live cattle there up 32 at 170.47. Feeders January up 37 at 222.85. March up 62 at 223.75. Lean hogs February down 45 at 68 even. April down a dime at 74.90. And the May lean hogs they're up 12 at 81.55. Quick check on the grains here. March corn is down three at 471 and a quarter with May down two and a quarter at 484 and a quarter. 
with crude oil trading right around on change, just below $72 a barrel. For the American Ag Network, I'm Richard Ristvet. This is Weather and Ag in Focus with Richard Riedel, Justin Storm, and Dean Wysocki. And welcome back to Weather and Ag in Focus. Thank you for joining us this afternoon on the brink of a new year. We'll be ready to roll into 2024 very soon. And we have a guest with us today who, speaking of rolling, she might not want to see those things rolling, and that's especially when it comes to livestock. Our guest today is Lisa Peterson. She is an NDSU Extension Livestock Specialist. Lisa, how are you today? I'm doing great. How are you? Fabulous. So I feel like our discussion today is going to be so timely after we just had this big ice storm across most of the state earlier this week. But let me just back up a second. Tell us what you what you do, where you are, those types of things in your work with NDSU. So my work with NDSU is pretty broad. Um, I'm stationed at the Central Grasslands Research Extension Center uh, near Streeter. Um, and at our research center, we I think we've in that area probably had the brunt of the ice this week. Um, as of late, early mid morning here, um, we were still out of power at our research center. So you know we definitely understand that. Um, in my extension work, um, you know I do a lot of things. I, I always say I'm a jack of all trades and master of very few. Uh, but the beef quality assurance program is something um, that I'm responsible for in the state, and so. Uh, helping our farmers and ranchers produce the highest quality, safest beef in the country and implement production practices to continue to assure that um, is one of the things I do. And along with that is this bovine emergency response program that you asked me to visit about to, uh, with you today. And then I was really interested in your discussion about open cows because um, body condition scoring cows and management of cows is something that's a big passion of mine. And um, certainly something we've been talking about, and uh, I like to hear that weather report that it's going to be warmer. Um, that's very, very good for our farmers and ranchers and their livestock. <laughs> oh, that's huge. And okay, I'm writing notes down as you talk because I'm thinking we got to come back to that open cows because you're going to be able to do a much better job of explaining all of that than I stumbled through. So I really well, actually, appreciate I think you did a great Lisa. job. <laughs> you did a fantastic <laughs> job of talking about that. So, um, you know, it's, it's a huge issue. Uh, huge numbers of open cows, relatively speaking, especially in the western, I would say, third of North Dakota, to be honest with you. So, yeah, it, it's a big deal. It's a very big deal. You know, since we're just, just kind of hitting on that. Oh. Let's, yeah, go let's ahead. Let's just Justin. hit that Sorry real quick that. since we're talking about the open cows instead of coming back to it. Let's just start with that. Do you have an idea or heard or hypothesize why we're seeing such a higher count in open cows this year compared to others? Is it really just down to the drought conditions by the end of last year that's doing this? Or what other factors might be playing a role? So in my opinion, and of course, you know, I'm not sure that we really know, to be honest, and, you know, we may never really know, um, is that our integrated system of cows, be their genetics, their management, their forage input, their milk production, um, has somehow gotten off kilter. And so somehow our inputs haven't probably met whatever um, they need to be to keep a cow going. And so what I really think has happened is that cows have, I call them energy checking accounts and energy savings accounts. And um, when cows are stressed, as Bridget said, they take more energy. When it's cold or it's extremely hot, they take more energy. And milk production has been trending up in our beef cattle operations, oh, for probably the past 10 to 15 years. And so um, milk production takes a lot of energy. Um, it takes a lot more energy to feed a dairy cow than it does um, a typical beef cow. And so I think somehow we have just depleted so much energy out of our cows that we have, quote unquote, as I would say, bankrupted them. And um, so we, the end result is that we've had open cows. And a lot of that is, you know, our cows have been under tremendous amount of stress for the last probably six or seven years between really bad winters and really dry summers and then at least in the western part of the state you know it was extremely wet 
And so there, those forages probably didn't have as high quality of nutrition in them as they typically do. And so it was just a perfect storm. But I, I think that if we had looked back, maybe we would have seen some of this coming. Um, I don't know in the herds that had really large numbers of open cows that they have had as many issues, but I think trending wise, just across the state, we've seen an increase in open cows in probably the last two or three years, um, just not at this rate. So that was a really long answer to, we don't really know, but we, you know, it's just a cow's really complex thing. And so mm -hmm. one of those little pieces gets off kilter somewhere and, you know, it, it's just really hard on them. No, I think that was a, was a good answer. And if anyone wants to join in on this conversation, we're speaking with Lisa Peterson, NDSU Extension Livestock Specialist, kind of talking about open cows right now. Uh, 701-293-9000 is the Red Wing Shoes phone line. And I wanted to ask, is this more statewide or is it kind of hit and miss localized or maybe I should say statewide or regional wide uh, on the above average open cows? Well, really interestingly, what we hear is that there's an increased number of um, open cows or cows that aren't pregnant from really um, the southern border to the northern border through the uh, plains. So from Texas to North Dakota and, you know, probably mm -hmm. spilling a little further east and west into Montana and Minnesota. And then, you know, even as we get, um, you know, Texas is a big area, but I think probably even into eastern New Mexico and maybe into Louisiana as well. Um, so we're hearing that. Um, of course, all of those areas have experienced a lot of drought in the last, you know, five years um, and some pretty tough winters. And so, you know, I think just all those things together and, you know, what we, this is going to have a long-term impact on our cattle markets. And one of the reasons why is that we were at a record low cow inventory as of January 1st, 2023. I suspect we'll see that that number will be again record low in 2024. I think the cattle on feed numbers come out this week. I, I could look over here at my cattle facts chart and tell me, um, but I think cattle on feed numbers come out this week or maybe they came out last week. And so I just think that we're going to continue to see this decreasing cow herd size and you know, that, that's going to have a lot of repercussions. Um, we've increased packing capacity again. And, you know, if a packer can't make a profit on the last um, animal that they harvested, they are going to shut the doors of that plant. And that was part of the contributors to what I would say a, a little bit of a crash in the cattle market in 2014 and 15. And we don't want to see that. So we got to keep our, our cattle numbers high enough to at least keep our our plants open but on the other side we should see an increase in, in cattle values because of a decreased supply of cattle and so that's a very very narrow window there of that supply and demand um, you just want that supply to be short enough that we can fill all the plants but um, high enough or high enough to we can fill all the plants but low enough to keep high prices so it, it'll be a very interesting several years coming forward I think Right. And I, I, we got to hit bottom of the hour news here soon. I want to squeak in two more questions before we do it, since it's still on the open cows thing. Uh, over the past five to 10 years, or I guess you could even go a little further back than that, but um, has this been an increasing trend in openings in cows over the last handful of years, or is it kind of just bounce around and this just so happens to be an anomaly year where we're seeing above average? You know, I think this is probably the biggest anomaly in those years. Um, you know, especially when you average things out of herds that have an extremely high pregnancy rate and, you know, they'll average out a herd that maybe doesn't have as high of a pregnancy rate. So I think, you know, we are hearing uh, many herds in some areas that have a far above average um, open rate in their cows. So I think this is a little bit of an anomaly. But I would say that if we lo really looked at the trends over the last four or five years, we would have seen an increase in percentage year to year. One of the tough things is, is that we don't really keep track of those numbers very well in the industry. And so mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure that we would have a good way of finding that. But just, you know, hearing producers talk, I think that that's what we could say. And, and veterinarians talk as well who do that testing. Right. And, and for folks that do this the cattle and raising calves and calving obviously they know what they're doing they're good at what they do but what are things that they can do to increase those odds of a 
cow getting pregnant? So uh, the number one thing that we can do is make sure that she's in a body condition score of at least five at calving time. Uh, so that means that we can't see any of her hind ribs, um, her last two ribs on her body. And in, a, in the north, that's hard because our cattle get pretty hairy, you know, that, that hair coat's really important to keeping them alive. And so it's, you have to look through that hair coat. And I always tell farmers and ranchers, have somebody else uh, evaluate the body condition score of your herds with you. Uh, because when you see your herds every day, you don't see those subtle changes. Um, and I even see it, you know, we ranch in South Dakota, but I go to North Dakota during the week to work. And I see changes in our herds that my husband probably doesn't see. And he's a great operator, but he looks at those cattle every day, sometimes two or three times a day. And I don't, I see them on, you know, Saturday and then I won't see him again until next Saturday, maybe. And so I'll, I'll see <laughs> those changes that he maybe doesn't see. So have somebody else look at your cattle too and, and um, see where your cattle are. I, historically speaking, we have always said that your cow should be between a four and a six at calving, but I really think a five to a seven or a five to a six is better, especially in the North, because every time we decrease the wind chill below 13 degrees, more or less, 15 degrees freezing numbers. It takes more energy in that cow than she can produce. So we have to increase the energy in their diet. And when we get down around 20 below, unless you have those cattle really in a heated facility, you can't put enough energy in them to maintain condition. And so we will experience a lot of 20 below wind chills in the Dakotas. That's just a fact of life. And so I think when we have those cows in a little heavier condition going into calving, it really provides some more cushion for them, um, maybe more energy in their energy savings account, if you want to look at it that way, um, to allow them to use as they get into more trying times in terms of energy. I see. Well, again, we're speaking with Lisa Peterson, NDSU Extension Livestock Specialist. If you want to join in on the conversation, you can reach out to us on the Red Wing Shoes phone line. That's 701-293-9000 or emails weather or ag at flagfamily.com. We got to hit bottom of the hour news with Ty Schoner from the WDAY News Center. And when we come back, we'll rejoin this conversation with Lisa. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Light up the season by treating yourself to a new vehicle at Pucklitch and Valley City. Choose from our wide selection of over 100 new Chevys available with special end of year savings. That means save nearly $8,200 on select new 2024 Chevy Silverado 1500. As we wrap up the year, we would like to thank our loyal community as you have made our success possible. Merry Christmas from everyone at Pucklet Chevrolet GMC in Valley City. See dealer for details. At Collins & Cronk, Raymond James, we are privileged to have our clients let us be a part of their lives. They share their families with us and their close friends. We get to help them develop their dreams and curb their fears. We are so grateful to have this honored and important role in their lives. This holiday season reminds us once again how important family is, and we are thankful to be a part of yours. Merry Christmas from all of us at Collins & Cronk, and a prosperous new year. Raymond James Financial Services, Inc., member FINRA, SIPC. Collins & Cronk is not a broker-dealer and is independent of Raymond James. Hello from the WDAY News Center. I'm Ty Schonert with your news update. Crews working around the clock to restore power to cities and towns in southeast North Dakota. However, some towns may not have electricity up before the new year. We have some of our accounts that will be on soon and some that might be not be on until next week. Obviously, if there's 700 plus poles that are down, it's going to take a long time to put those back up. Cass County Electric Cooperative CEO Marshall Albright says over 700 electrical poles in their service area snapped due to the sheer weight of the ice on power lines during the holiday ice storm. In the southeast region, more than 15,000 customers' power has been restored since last Thursday afternoon. Two men arrested in connection with burglaries of two businesses in and around Fargo. Police say a Mark Kovacevic and David Iden used crowbars to break into Auto Garage in Mapleton and Custom Cinema and Sound and Audio Garage in Fargo on December 22nd. They're accused of stealing thousands of dollars worth of tools and items. They were identified as suspects after investigators reviewed security video. Both face multiple charges. 
and at least one person dying after a large vehicle breaking through the ice on Lake of the Woods. The Lake of the Woods County Sheriff's Office says it happened Wednesday near a resort in the northwest angle. A group was riding in a large vehicle used to transport anglers out on the ice when it broke through. I'm Ty Schoenert with WDAYRadioNow.com. First at the news when you need to know. 17% of people say pancakes are the worst food to find hair in. Especially if we're on that naked cruise. (laughs) You could cover all the windows with paper and do a naked show, but... I am not doing a naked (laughs) show. Word. You ain't ain't gonna want to get nude with us? There you go. No. Wow, why not? I am not doing a naked show. See, now, I mostly suggested that just for the pure gold response that it received. (laughs) Coffee Club on WDAY. Attention all firearms collectors, firearms dealers, hunters, and other firearms enthusiasts. Dakota Territory Gun Collectors Association Gun Show will be in West Fargo, January 6th and 7th at the Red River Valley Fairgrounds in West Fargo. There will be over 350 tables full of guns, ammo, and accessories on display. Buy, sell, swap, trade. You don't want to miss this. The Dakota Territory Gun Collectors in West Fargo at the Red River Valley Fairgrounds. Weather and Ag in Focus on WDAY Radio. And welcome back to Weather and Ag in Focus. And I love the comments that we are getting from folks who are watching online, such as, I had no idea so much work went into taking care of a cow herd. Um, how we got to be careful with this cow shaming as we talk about their body conditioning scores. And our <laughs> guest, Lisa Peterson, is an expert. She is an NDSU livestock extension specialist. And Lisa, thank you for bringing all of your knowledge with us today. We've, we've veered a little off track, but there was a whole big reason okay. I got a hold of you. <laughs> well, okay. this just means and we've got more no questions body and we'll do this shaming. again. Oh, good. Yes. Okay. Well, there's no body condition shaving. We just want cows to be um, in good condition. We'll just say that. Healthy. Healthy and ready to calve. Healthy. Yes, absolutely. So one of the things that I saw that you are doing is called a bovine emergency response program. And this caught my attention. And then we had a nice storm. And I thought through all of the icy roads that we just went through and people still waiting to get their power back, what if there had been a bull rack full of cattle going down I-29 that slid into the ditch. How do we respond to that? And tell us a little bit about your your training and what good that can bring to communities who might face that situation. So um, our bovine emergency response program is really designed to be a proactive specialized training um, to minimize additional animal harm. You know, we always say in these things that the worst thing that has happened to the animals in accidents has probably already happened. Um, when they're in them. And then we also want to assure responder, excuse me, responder and public safety um, in these transportation crashes. And so it, it's a really unique program. Um, we developed it here in North Dakota with the help of um, colleagues at West Virginia University, um, Tennessee, University of Tennessee, Iowa State University, and the Ohio State University. And It's a program we've done all over the country. Uh, We just finished a swing of doing uh, six of them in Minnesota, North Dakota, and South Dakota um, between August, the end of August, beginning of September, and the beginning of December. And the goal is to help people, help first responders be more prepared um, should these crashes occur. So when you think about the trainings that you've done and going forward, what's that big eye-opening moment for so many of them that they think, wow, I I hadn't even considered that in an on-site accident? Um, Probably the biggest is, is that everybody wants to get the animals out of the crash, out of the trailer, you know, whether it's horses in a horse trailer or cattle in a cattle pot, everybody wants to get the animals out first. And in all reality, the best thing that we can do for Uh, both public safety, responder safety, and animal safety is leave them in those trailers until we get a containment scene built. Um, That way we don't have loose animals that oncoming traffic can hit or that can, you know, excited animals, agitated animals are a human safety risk. So we then don't want them taking first responders and charging first responders. So 
you know, containing that scene and, and then not opening those trailers if you don't have to until you have that containment built. I think that that is the biggest aha moment um, by, by and large for most first responders. What about when, when you just comes... said that? Oh, oh just a sec, ahead, Justin. Bridget, I'll when step you... in after that. When you just said that, Lisa, about, you know, you don't want that very disoriented, upset critter to charge a first responder. It just occurred to me, you don't need a victim who fights back. And that's probably yes. your safety as well as the animal's safety at that point, too. It absolutely is. You know, um, there's a very number, depending on, you know, all of the things that can happen in a, a crash, on whether we'll lose any livestock or all the livestock in a trailer. And, um, you know, we don't want to, to have to euthanize any additional animals. However, if an animal is fractious and aggressive, uh, we always tell first responders that their life is worth more than the animal and to euthanize them. And so, right, you know, if, if they're aggressive, um, they're uh, a harm to themselves, they're harm to other animals, and they're harm to humans. And human life is always the most important. Right. And when it comes to first responders coming to these kind of accidents, is there a training or a knowledge on how they should be approaching these situations? And I guess I'm referring to sirens, bright flashing lights. If you know you're coming up to a, a say a rollover or a ditch a crash with a cattle trailer or horses, pigs, whatever it happens to be, should they be trained or have a knowledge? I'm like, all right, I, I need to turn my, my lights or my at least my sirens off so I'm not spooking these animals. You could go on the road with us because that's one of the things we teach them is that, you know, set your scene um, perimeter a long ways away. And that's so easy to do in the Dakotas and Minnesota because, you know, we have long stretches of um, straight roads. And if we have to go around section lines or take another exit to, to detour um, oncoming traffic, we can do that. You know, I always remind first responders that your lights and sirens are really um, for the public. They're not for the scene. Um, they're to keep the scene safe. And so if we can set off that parameter a mile in each direction, you can have your flashing lights there. But then they're not in the scene. Those flashing lights are very, very agitating to animals. Um, they bother their eyes. They bother my eyes, you know, especially these new um, LED lights that they have. They're so bright and that strobe just drives me crazy. And so you're a sitting duck. I, I always tell first responders, you're a sitting duck with all your reflective equipment that you have to have on with flashing lights around animals that are scared um, and maybe injured and nervous and potentially fractious. That's just setting you up to be a target for them. And so we encourage them to not have their lights and sirens in the scene, make a big scene um, response area so that they can move that stuff out and then just have a nice quiet calm as possible um, area to work um, their accident scene. Yeah. So Lisa would you say when it comes to some of these accident scenes you're going to prepare differently if it's a, a single like three slant horse trailer that's a gooseneck on the back of a pickup versus a big cattle pot that's loaded full of hogs. I mean, it's like a one car crash versus multi car pile up at that point, and you teach accordingly so people know what they need to be doing differently depending on that site. Right. So, you know, we always say that we have a framework that is stringent enough to cover some um, very valuable tenants, but still flexible enough for local needs, different state needs, different species needs, all of those kind of things. And so, you know, we would still say that you need to contain the scene with horses. In fact, horses that are scared, and our, our family raises and runs race horses, horses that are scared are very dangerous. And so, you know, contain your scene with a horse, just like you would with uh, isoween pigs or uh, bison, and, you know, mm -hmm. have that scene contained. But then how you manage that scene and do the scene might be very, you know, one of the things people, especially when horses and horse trailers live in quarters trailers is that oftentimes there will be humans inside those trailers traveling and so be prepared for that and always be looking for humans in those cases too and you know most first responders have no idea that there can be a human inside those living quarters trailers or even in our big horse transport vans lots of times their grooms ride with those horses 
that's a huge point I forgot about as well is you do actually have an area in those trailers that you may have a human and you need to be on the yes. lookout for them as well as the, the animals that are being transported all at the same time. Um, when you get done with one of the training sessions, how impacted are those who are listening? Is there a lot of light bulb moments for those who have been in your classes? The huge impact moments, you know, we, I just got um, completed um, compiling all of our data for this fall run. And, you know, you will see somewhere around a 90% improvement in knowledge gained per session that or per uh, piece of the session that we do or a uh, piece of the course, each topic, um, huge aha moments. I, I have to say it is probably the most impactful training I've really ever been a part of. And that's so humbling. And it, it's really fun to do those high impact things. You know, we hear now in our follow-up surveys that we do with people who've been through the trainings, somewhere around 80% respond, maybe 80 to 85% respond to an accident within the first six months of doing, uh, going through this training. And of those, nearly 100% say that what they have learned in those trainings help them uh, address the scene better, or address the crash better. You know, I, I'll tell a story that in one of our trainings this fall, um, the local sheriff's department was called to help euthanize some cattle that had ergot poisoning. And the sheriff, with tears in his eyes, thanked me so much for our training. And he said, I wished I had had this training before I had to euthanize those cattle because it would have been better for me and the cattle. And so, you know, we tried to teach them things that they can use, whether they're um, dealing with a, a deer that has been hit on the road. We actually covered deer euthanasia in our training or whether they're just dealing with some cattle that are out on the road that maybe have gotten out of a fence and so how to help herd those cattle back. Um, we talk about herd biosecurity and so we just maybe don't wanna dump cattle together with another set of cattle, but also we don't wanna take any diseases home with us. And you know there are several zoonotic diseases that livestock carry that humans can get or humans can give to livestock. And so we don't want to take those home either. And so at the end of the day, we want every single person who responds to that scene, whether they're a firefighter, um, a law enforcement member, an EMT, or just a general farmer and rancher who was called to help uh, to go home safe and uh, get up safe tomorrow. And so we also address uh, debriefing in our trainings. Um, one of the incidents that was really a, a, an impetus for this training occurred in North Dakota, and it was a really tragic event and the the community lost their entire volunteer fire department and all their law enforcement people and it was one of the things we learned was that no debriefing was done and um, people that were involved in that crash and it's been probably over 15 years ago now um, still won't talk about that today and so um, we really emphasize taking care of the mental piece of this for the humans who respond because I don't know of a single fire department or law enforcement group that is um, overrun with people wanting to join their, their ranks. And so we need to take care of our first responders um, and the volunteer people who show up to help when they're called. Lisa, I cannot say thank you enough for talking about this bovine emergency response training that you all are doing. This is something that I think we want to highly encourage among all of our our counties, as far as our sheriffs and deputies, as well as for our local fire departments, the volunteers that are all out there across the states that we serve. So if folks are interested and want to reach out to you so they can talk with, directly with you about having this training, how can they do that? So in North Dakota, we really try to set these up through our county extension offices. Um, and so if um, somebody wants this in their local trainings here in North Dakota, um, talk to your county extension agent. In Minnesota, I suggest that they again talk to extension or their um, state board of animal health. And in South Dakota, also their extension service, or, you know, they can contact me at the Central Grasslands Research Extension Center. Um, my cell phone number is 701-226-3733, or you can email me at Lisa. Dot Peterson and it's P E D as in dog E R S O N at N D S U dot E D U. And the information that you gave us with the the promotional flyer, et cetera, we're going to put that on our website along okay. with this audio so That's that awesome. folks can also find it when they want to contact you. And 
Lisa, thank you so much. You have a wonderful new year. I hope the power comes back on real soon for all of you. Yes, absolutely. You know, <laughs> and everybody be safe and, you know, stay away from down power lines. I, I, we can't stress that enough. Um, those are things that will, are very dangerous and I hope people remember to stay away from them. I also need to thank um, here in North Dakota and South Dakota and Minnesota, our beef checkoff groups have put quite a bit of funding into the development of our bovine emergency response program and also hosting some of those trainings. So, you know, the program is jointly funded by the beef checkoff entities in those states, along with our extension services. Ah, thank you for that reminder. And folks, don't go anywhere. We want to go through that weather one more time as we go into the New Year's weekend. Stay tuned. Thank you. You can always count on Miller High Life, the champagne of beers. Always crisp, always easy drinking, always just right. The perfect balance of flavor and refreshment since 1903. Welcome to the High Life. Twenty nineteen Miller Brewing Company, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Celebrate responsibly. This is Mark Wagner at ND Estate Services. I want to thank all the listeners out there and just really wishing you a very Merry Christmas. God bless you. Have a happy new year. Encouraging you to give your family the gift of avoiding probate at death, eliminating legal guardianship when you're incapacitated, saving taxes, protecting their inheritance. Find out more at ndestateservices.com 701-3180 Right now, by using the promo code WDAY at MyPillow.com, you can get some really amazing deals. The Giza Dream Bed Sheets for $29.98. The Queen and King MyPillow 2.0, save 50%. Also, the Roll and Go Anywhere MyPillow at $9.99. Plus, other items like original My Slippers, you can save 50% off on towel sets, kitchen towels, My Mattress Topper 2.0, robes. I mean, there are endless items you can get at fantastic holiday deals just by using the promo code WDAY. Go to MyPillow.com, click on Radio Listener Specials, and then use that promo code WDAY. Or call 1-800-875-0644. That's 800-875-0644. Using promo code WDAY for all the great savings at MyPillow.com. That's MyPillow.com. Mr. Clean, Mr. Clean. Of course I use Mr. Clean Magic Eraser to clean tough messes off my stovetop and bathtub. But then I discovered I can also use it to easily clean my patio furniture and even my shoes. I'm hooked. And when wipes won't cut it, I use Magic Eraser Sheets. They're thin and flexible erasers, perfect for everyday messes, like gunk on my counters and sinks. They really are magical. The reviews are in. Mr. Clean Magic Eraser and Sheets make cleaning look easy. Here's to Prilosec OTC. Without Prilosec, I wouldn't be able to enjoy all this yummy holiday food. Speaking of, whoever made that apple pie, delicious. Thank you. I just take one pill each morning and zero heartburn all day. So cheers to Prilosec OTC. Ooh, are those jalapeno poppers? Prilosec OTC prevents excess acid that can cause heartburn, so you can enjoy the holidays. One pill a day, 24 hours, zero heartburn. It's possible while taking Prilosec OTC. Use it directed for 14 days to treat frequent heartburn, not for immediate relief. I feel like I'm constantly cleaning hair off my bathroom floor. At least my Swiffer Sweeper makes it easy. Sweeper heavy-duty dry cloths have ultra-thick pads to trap and lock hairs, like a hair magnet. And when I'm finished cleaning up my hair, Sweeper takes care of his, too. Now the hair is gone, all thanks to Swiffer. Try Swiffer Sweeper heavy-duty dry cloths. I promise you'll love them or your money back. And also try Swiffer Sweeper Wet to make quick work of tough, sticky messes. This is Weather and Ag in Focus with Richard Riedel, Justin Storm, and Dean Wysocki. I had to squeak a screaming goat in there last moment before we head off for the New Year's. Thanks for rejoining us. It's 1.56. We got about two and a half minutes left of our show. Just enough time to run down the forecast for the new year, and it's uh, 
looking pretty nice with a, maybe you could say a little hiccup or a little bump in the road on Saturday, but even that I don't think is going to be too bad. Temperatures right now in Fargo, about 39 degrees, a lot of mid and upper 30s in the Southern Valley, Northwest Minnesota, the coldest in the low 30s out West, looking at temperatures in the low 40s and even a couple of upper 40s in Southeastern North Dakota, shaping up to be a nice day with highs near 40 here today. Sunny skies, West Northwest winds will switch to the West about five to 10 miles per hour throughout this afternoon for tonight the clouds are going to roll in temperatures still staying above our daytime high averages at 22 degrees for tonight it'll turn breezy as we head into saturday though those northwest winds will gust upwards of 30 miles an hour it's going to be cloudy with a few scattered light snow showers around the area most areas a half inch or less of accumulation down to just a light dusting trace amounts uh, a few spots lakes country northwestern minnesota could maybe see up to an inch in localized area accumulation but with the light snow and the wind there will be a little blowing snow while it's falling so a little reduced visibility from time to time if you're driving through those snow showers temperatures over the weekend are stuck in the mid 20s the wind will lighten up on sunday we'll see a little more sunshine but as for the beginning of 2024 bridget our average daytime highs are 19 I have 33 degrees on Monday and 30 degrees on Tuesday. Not too bad. And even through the rest of the week, temperatures are staying in the 20s, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and what appears to be Sunday as well. I say appear because I'm watching the possibility of some Arctic air in Canada building next week that may start to spill into the northern portion of the United States that second week of January. We'll just keep an eye on that, but that could be our first taste of some winter, actual winter temperatures with temperatures in the single digits to below zero. I think we can prepare for it because we've had a really good run so far. Hopefully we've all, cross your fingers, hopefully we've all saved some money on our home heating costs so we can get through this cold spell and move right ahead to spring. Come on, it's going to be okay. (laughs) Dang it, Texas, I'm still paying from the last ice storm and we just had another one shoot yeah exactly. well coming up next this is jay thomas show guest host jason berg from track talk we're out of here i think we're back on the second of january everyone have a great safe new year's it's the coffee